Today we're gonna go over utilizing the Magic Leap 2 SDK to detect controller input changes, read controller state information directly, and also going over how we can detect gestures generated from the controller touchpad. We're also going to make use of the head pose information to basically adjust the UI position, rotation, which will make the UI follow us around. Lastly, I like to test all these features by using the powerful dev tool called the application simulator. So let's jump into my computer and start working on it. All right, we're gonna be creating a brand new project with Unity for Magic Leap 2. I already showed you how to do that, so I'm gonna be linking to a video right above it so you guys know all the steps. So in this case, I have an extra rig and I'm also adding a logger. Again, in that video, I walk you through that process. The logger is gonna be used to be able to display information that we're getting from the controllers and also from our head post. Then go into the package manager and this is something that you can download from the Magic Leap Hub. It's going to be the application simulator for Unity. So just make sure you download it in advance. Once you do it, you're gonna see what I have right now, which is basically a tar file. And this is a file that we're gonna use to basically install the application simulator for Unity, which is really, really powerful. And it's gonna allow us to test right in Unity without actually having to deploy every single time, even though we're gonna be deploying multiple times because I wanna show you the both versions. And then here I'm just resizing things and placing things correctly. If you go back into Unity, you're gonna see that we can change the layouts, which is what I did in this case. This is the default layout for the application simulator. As you can see here, as I hold the right click on my mouse and move my mouse around, I can basically you know, move around this scene area, which is a application simulator device view that Magic Leap provides. You can also see in this area, we can see kind of like a scene view, which is all part of the Magic Leap 2 simulator. I can also go in and out by basically holding my right mouse click and basically hitting my W key, also ASD to either go to the left, to the right, and then go back. I can also select the number six on my keyboard, and you can see that I can have the actual controller selected. You can also see the values on the right-hand side are updating. I can move my mouse around by holding the right mouse click, just like I did when we were moving the actual head pose. Now let's go ahead and create a new folder because we're going to be creating a new script. It's gonna be basically the juice of this video, and this script is going to be called the controller input manager. This is where we're going to be basically learning all about input when it comes to Magic Leap. I'm also going to be doing another script for the head post, and this is gonna be the head input manager. This is gonna be tracking information about our head post, which we're going to be using later on on this video. Okay, so the next thing that I'm gonna do is let's go ahead and type in everything that we're gonna use for this tutorial. So we're gonna do private and then material. And this is gonna be the controller area material, which we're going to be used to place an object in the scene that we're gonna be tracking with the controller position and rotation. I'm also going to need the controller position offset because I want to place it a little bit further away from the pivot point. And then the next property is going to be basically to how long and how frequently we're going to be displaying information from the controller. I didn't wanna do it on the update. So this is gonna be every half a second we're going to be displaying information for the controller. So to set up the inputs on the Magic Leap, you're gonna need an instance of the Magic Leap inputs. You're also going to need the controller action. So that's going to be two different instances. And the way that you set it up is we're gonna do it in the star. So we're also gonna need another game object where we're going to be basically creating a cube and that cube is going to be positioned a little bit of an offset from the controller. And that's what the controller area is gonna be. I'm also going to be generating a color for that object that is going to be randomized, and that's what the last generated random color is gonna be. I also want to track the controller position, basically the last position and also the last rotation. And this is gonna be helpful for basically placing that cube at the correct position and rotation. And then to be able to create a gesture, we're gonna be using the gesture system extensions the touchpad gesture event. So we're gonna be doing that later on on, the, on this script implementation. Then to create a Magic Leap input, just do Magic Leap inputs and then just use the word new. I'm also going to be enable the input and this comes from the input system that Unity provides is basically using the same structure. Then on the controller actions, we need to pass in the Magic Leap input and that's how you can basically get the input set up for the controller. And then this next section is going to be for events that we want to basically listen to. And this is how you can do it. You can do it for many different buttons on the controller. In the case of the trigger, I can basically attach myself to the started event. 
And when the started event executes, I'm basically going to be calling into the trigger started. And then by default, it's gonna, it's gonna say not implemented. We're going to be updating that. I can also basically listen to the perform event. And we're gonna be also renaming this so that basically it looks and it sounds a lot better. And then also the trigger cancel is gonna be when I stop basically holding the trigger button. This is what it's going to be executed at that point. And then I can use my logger that instance, the log info to basically type in information that I want to display. I'm also gonna reorganize this so that they are in the same order of the ones that I did on the declaration. So I'm gonna have started, perform, and also cancel. And we can just basically rename some of these messages so that we can see them when they run on the logger. Now we need to create a new, basically a new game object and that new game object is gonna be controller input manager. And you can name it anything you like. I normally like to name them as the script is named. So in this case, it matches that. We can zero out everything. I can just change the trigger and we can see that information right on the canvas. I can basically hold the button. You can see that it's holding the trigger button. I can do that, you know, multiple times. I can also rotate our controller. Okay, so the next thing that I wanna show you though is if we wanted to get the values, this is how you can get the values from the callback context. Basically, you give it the type, read value is a generic. In this case, the trigger button is a flow. So I'm basically getting the flow value for, for the trigger execution that I did with the controller. I can also display that value, which is gonna be very helpful. So that's why I did that. And we can see it here as we basically change the trigger value, you can get the decimal implementation, a decimal value representation of the trigger. And also the bumper is working because that was the last thing that we also added. You can also see it running on the device. So you can see here that I'm getting the different trigger events. And let's go ahead and add a couple more things. So I'm gonna be working on that display information, which we're gonna be showing every half a second. So I'm gonna be doing an enumerator to do that. We can just do that on a while loop. And none of these is super, super clean, guys, but this is just gonna give us and give you information on how you can approach getting different information from the input devices available with Magic Leap 2. So controller actions is tracked. It's going to make sure that we have the controller connected and that it's currently being tracked. That way we know that we can access the value. Otherwise, everything is gonna be either null or zero. So we wanna make sure that that is true. And then this is how you can access some of those values directly. You can access the controller actions position that read value or generic. And then in the, in the the basically in the case of position is a vector three. So I know that I can get the X, Y, and Z value for the controller. And I can do the same thing with the actual rotation. It's a quaternion. So it's gonna give us the extra W value. And if you wanna display that information, we can do use our logger here as well. We can do controller position. And also we can do the same thing and grab the controller rotation. That way we can show that information right on the logger. And we can get also the controller rotation in this case. So the other values that you can also get in here, and this is gonna be a really good example because there's different value types, right? For different controller actions. So in the case of the actual bumper, in this case, I just wanted to know, okay, if the bumper set to true or is it set to false? So it's either a one or a zero, which is what I'm gonna be doing here with the bumper. You can also do that with the trigger or with any action that you have. There's an in-progress property that you can access. We can also access the acceleration, which is what I'm, I'm gonna show you here. If I wanna know the value of the acceleration, which is, happens to be a vector three, then you can also get that. So the controllers give you a lot of different information and this is what you can use to access that. The touchpad position is going to be basically a vector two. So you're gonna be changing the type. If you don't change the type, it's gonna throw an exception. Just know that some of these value mappings I'm going to be including in the description that you guys know what they should be. And then touchpad force is gonna be a flow. So that's how I can get that information. And then basically to call the core routine, just make sure that you do a start core routine. And then we can just call the method that we created. The next thing that I wanna do though is I wanna set the last controller position and also the last controller known rotation. So I'm gonna be using these values later on. So I'm just gonna basically get them here on the update. And this one, these ones are gonna be more updated than the ones on my core routine. So that's why I did it in here because I need these to be able to change an object position and rotation. Okay. 
Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is let's go ahead and create a new game object. And this is going to be for our controller area that, that I want to show right next to the controller. So in this case, it's going to be a cube. So we can just call the game object that create primitive and pass in the type. I also want to basically get the render. And the reason why I want to get the render is because I want to change the material. And that's going to be a material that I'm going to be able to, to pass in. And then the next thing that I'm going to do is once I know that, then I want to resize this. Otherwise, it's going to be gigantic. Remember, we're dealing with low, basically a very short measurement because we're dealing with augmented reality. So I'm going to change this to be 0 0.1, 0 0.1 all the way across. That way it's going to be about the size of the controller, maybe a little bit bigger. And then the next thing that I'm going to do though, now that we have those values, I want to make sure that I change the position and now also the rotation based on the position that I'm getting from the controller here on the update meta. We can just say last controller non position and also add an offset so that we're not colliding with the controller. It just looks better and allows you to, to see what, what I'm you know, trying to do with the tutorial. And I can also update the rotation because I want to be able to show you that as well. And then here I'm just going to associate a material and also change the position to be a little bit off from the controller. So the next thing that I'm going to do though is I want to change the implementation of the trigger port form. We're going to be generating a random color. And the reason why I want to do this is because I just want to do something different than just displaying a value. In this case, we can change the controller area, which is the cube that we just created. And let's just change its material color to the random generated color that we are generating on this line. Then I'm going to do the same thing with the bumper. But in this case, I'm going to be changing the scale value of the cube that we just created. So our controller area is going to be changing sizes. It's going to be a small size that we're basically generating from this range. And we can change the local scale, like I said, and then we can just pass in the random scale, the X, Y, and Z. That's going to give us a variety of different tests that we can run. It just looks a lot cooler. So the next thing that we need to do, though, that it is good practice is to remove all the different listeners that we added. So in our case, we added listeners for the trigger and also for the bumper action. So just make sure that you're removing them by just changing the value of plus to a minus, And that's just going to be removing those events so that we're not listening to those events anymore. So the next part is going to be about registering to the gesture subsystem. So to be able to do that, though, we need to call into the ML device register gesture subsystem. So this is how you code it. You basically call into this method. And then we can also check to make sure that that subsystem is available. So just make sure that it is available by checking to make sure that it's not null. If it's not null, we can basically bind to the event, the on touchpad gesture change. And then we can just create a new listener. And this listener is going to be, I'm going to rename it to something shorter. And to be able to implement it, we're going to be also renaming here the argument so that it's just not called OBJ. And then we're just going to call into this gesture event, which is a variable that we have on the top. And we can rename it so that they're not having the same name. And then we can just do debug.log and make sure that we have whatever the gesture was, we can display here on the log. And then the next thing that we can do, though, is I can basically check for a specific gesture. In my case, I want to basically launch a ball. And whenever we're throwing that ball, we're going to be making sure that we're doing a swipe up. So we can say this current gesture event is of a specific type. The specific type is going to be swipe. And then I want to make sure that the direction is going to be up. And then I want to make sure that we're only doing this on completed. So this is how you can do. There's a variety of gestures that you can generate by using this. I also need to unregister the actual gesture subsystem. Just make sure that you also check to make sure there's no null and then just do your minus on the gesture detected and just call into unregister gesture subsystem. And this is how it looks. Once we get it up and running, we can have basically we have our model in here and then I can, you know, I can change colors. I can change the size so we know that our new implementation for the trigger and the button is working. I can also move around here so you guys can see better. And we can also rotate our controller. So we're getting the rotation of the controller. We're also getting the movement, so everything is working correctly. And we can also just change here the values and of the trigger. We can also, in this case, test it on the device. You can see that it's all working 
on the device as well. And it's pretty smooth. I mean, this is a really powerful device. So there's also another component that Unity provides out of the box, which is the track post driver, which is part of the new input system. You can see here that we're getting the center eye position and also the center eye rotation. And then in the game controller, we're using the same component, we just have different bindings. In this case, we're using the pointer position and pointer rotation, the magic leap it's providing to us by using this input actions file, which they already mapped for us. So that's something that you can use and they have a lot of different mappings in here for HMD, for eyes, for left hand, and also the right hand. So you can use these input actions or use the API as I show you when we did the implementation of the control input manager. In the case of the head input manager, we're gonna be getting the head post position and also the rotation. And the reason why I'm gonna be doing this is because I want to change the position and rotation of the UI that we're using for the logger. So we have a head post position input action and also a head post rotation input action. So in this case, the header is gonna be basically just to show you that the next objects are going to be for the UI that we're going to be tracking. In this case, we're just gonna be creating a game object, object to control, we're gonna be mapping that to the logger. And then we can also get the actual head pose offset because I wanna make sure that the UI is placed at a distance. So that's why we're gonna be using that offset. And I also want to basically smooth out how frequently we're going to be changing the position and also the rotation. And in the start method, we're just gonna make sure that we have the head pose position input action basically populated and reference through the inspector. And if we do, then we can enable it. We also want to bind to the perform method. So that's what's gonna be basically getting that value updated. We can do this on the update method if we wanted to basically get the position and smooth out the position of the UI. I think it'll look cleaner, but in this case, it's just a demo. So we're just gonna be doing that on the perform methods. So in this one, I'm just gonna go ahead and rename it to rotation change. So we have two different actions that we're listening to. In the case of the position change, I want to get the head pose. So again, in this case, we're gonna be reading the value directly. So this is a way that you can read the value. We're gonna be basically just accessing our OBJ, read value, vector three. And then we can use this value to basically learn the position that we're going to be placing the UI to. So we're getting the value of the object control transform position, and then also changing the target position, which is gonna be the head pose offset, and then basically smoothing that out by multiplying time delta by the smooth speed. And then in the rotation change, we're gonna be doing something very similar. Just go ahead and associate it. We're gonna be offsetting the head post to be about two meters away. And then the smooth speed is also going to be two. And then the bindings though, we're gonna be using the same bindings that we had on the main camera. So we're gonna be using the center eye position, which is going to be from the XR HMD. And then the same thing on the rotation, we're gonna be using what the main camera had, which is going to be the center eye rotation. And then we can check also the main camera just to make sure that we did map to the same values, which we did. And I know that because I did it multiple times. All right, guys, so I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions about input or reading information directly from the headset or the controller, please let me know below in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell because that's going to allow me to bring you a lot more videos. Thank you very much, guys.